I've been charged with talking about network architectures, um, network architecture trends um, for you guys. Um, so I'll give a, um, a, it's a very low level architectural overview of the networks that I'm going to talk about uh, throughout the, this week, I think tomorrow or tonight, there is a talk on MPI and other programming models. And I talk about higher level abstractions, slightly higher level abstractions compared to what the networks themselves provide. But uh, I think it's a good idea to know about how the network itself works, okay, what it can do, what it can't do, and broadly what the trends are going forward for the networks. Okay, so um, a quick um, overview. I, um, I took the slide from um, previous speakers at DOE, and there was a report on Exascale, but I modified this slightly. I wanted to point out a few things over here. Uh, first of all, I. Uh, I had to modify some of the numbers over here because they didn't quite make sense even today on today's systems. But I think this is about right of where our trends are going. Uh, so we are putting together systems about 150 to 300 petaflop scale. We are looking to put together exaflop machines 2023, 20, 2024 20, time frame. And uh, one of the big things that ha is happening is the node performance is going up a lot. It's already going up from the uh, current generation machines and it's going to go further in the exascale sort of machines. The number of nodes themselves is not going up too much, about 2x perhaps, uh, but each node is becoming fatter, okay? And the network bandwidth is going, to, going up tremendously, uh, going up, going from the current generation machines all the way to exascale. Okay, so what does uh, these mean uh, for the general trends of the architectures and what does this mean for the network specifically? So first of all, the number of nodes is increasing, but at a moderate pace, about 2x, let's say. Number of cores or threads per node is increasing rapidly. Okay, lots and lots of cores per node, which means now you have a bunch of uh, nodes, a uh, bunch of cores or threads driving a network. Each core is not increasing in speed, so the clock frequency has stagnated. We all know that stuff. And probably the most controversial stuff is the chip logic complexity is not increasing. It's rather, it's decreasing. The, the number of, for example, out of order instructions are being taken away for putting more in order instruction uh, capabilities. Uh, no pipelining or reduced pipelining. No batch prediction. Okay, Some of these uh, might go away. Some of these might say, this is probably the most controversial of the list of trends that is going on for the node architectures. So what does this mean for the network architecture itself, okay? First is, there are more cores driving a network. A network, traditionally, was a, you drive network data from a core as fast as possible. You're moving towards a trend where there are lots and lots of cores that are trying to drive a network. There's more sharing going on in the network infrastructure. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And the ab ab aggregate amount of communication from each node is not changing much. It's probably increasing a little bit, but it's more fine grain. okay? So you, you don't have this fat course dumping a lot of data onto the network, but you have a lot of this tiny course dumping a small amount of data on the network. So you have lots of this small fine grained sort of communication that's, uh, that's going to become uh, the trend. And the last, a single core or a single thread is no longer sufficient to drive the full performance of the network. That's already true today. That's going to be even more true, uh, in, even more true? <laughs> It'll continue to be true in the future. <laughs> All right, sorry, I didn't sleep much last night. Okay, so um, let's uh, take a quick look at the simplified network architecture uh, over here. This is, this is not how current network, uh, current system architectures look like. This, is, this used to be true about 15 years ago. Okay, but I think it's a good proxy for what we want to understand from how the system uh, and the network architecture connected to the system looks like. Okay, so we have a CPU, a bunch of CPUs. Each of them have a bunch of cores. We have some memory, okay. Let's say they're connected to the memory in some way, all right. Traditionally, that used to be through a NOT bridge. Uh, or now we have memory controllers integrated on the chip, but whatever. Some, some way they're connected to the memory. Now you have an I.O. bus. IO interconnect that connects this subsystem to a network adapter, okay, a network interface card, a network card. And that is connected through a network link to a switch, which is connected to the switches and so on, okay. Several things to notice over here. A bunch of hardware components that are tied together in various interconnects, right? You have this processors and memory tied together. 
with this subsystem you have the network adapter tied together with an IO bus or IO interconnect, IO interconnect and from the network adapter to the network switch you have a network link and more network links going out of the switch, okay. That's as a hardware architecture, but there are a bunch of software aspects going on over here as well. There is a protocol stack running over here that's driving the network. Sometimes the protocol stack is running on the network adapter and so on. In this architecture, in this very rough, simple architecture, there's several bottlenecks that we need to think about if you, are, if you want to design a balanced system, okay? The first is there are processing bottlenecks over here, the process, processor memory subsystem. You need to address those. There's the IO bus bottlenecks, the IO interface bottlenecks, how the data moves from the memory subsystem to the network adapter itself. Network end host bottlenecks, how the data goes out from the network adapter to the switches. And finally, network fabric bottlenecks, where how the data in the, once it's dumped into the network, how it traverses to the topology and reaches the end host. Okay. All right, so uh, first let's look at the network adapters. Uh, so of, of these three uh, sets, I, I made the slides last night, so you know, as, as we progress, the number of slides keep shrinking in each section, and you become more sparse, but hopefully you can get the picture out of these three. Okay, first one, the network adapters. If you go back, if you, uh, you know, go many years back, 1979, right? That, that's when the network started in earnest, right? When people started building networks. People had a Ethernet, what is called a traditional Ethernet, not, not even fast Ethernet, traditional Ethernet, 10 megabit per second. There was a 3 mega, megabit per second uh, version available before that, but let's say 10 megabit per second. And for a long time, they were happy with that. For 14 years, they said, okay, no more network uh, enhancements required. After that, 1993, fast Ethernet, 100 megabit per second network came out. And there was a big rush for faster networks going all the way to gigabit ethernet fiber channel, which went up to a gigabit per second network. People were happy with that. They thought, okay, we have very fast networks, everything is very good, okay, we're happy with that. Eventually, we realized that, nah, not quite, it's not quite as fast as we originally thought. So people started designing more uh, uh, higher bandwidth networks, okay higher bandwidth with respect to the raw speed, higher IO interconnects, and so on. And today, we are at a point where we have about 50 to 60 gigabit per second networks. Each, la each link of the network adapter is about 50 to 60 gigabit per second, okay? And this is, uh, this is just a current generation. The next generation is expected to have about 100 gigabit per second per network link, okay? And this is just one network link it's pretty easy to add more network links, okay? It's pretty easy to add more parallelism with respect to network links. So you can imagine where you could build a network with five or six different network links, so each node can drive 500 or 600 gigabit per second networks, okay? Multiple network links are already becoming a commonplace, like the Oak Ridge, the new machine put to, being put together at Oak Ridge, Livermore, uh, Japan, the post T2K machine. They all have at least two uh, outward, outgoing, well, it's bidirectional, outgoing and incoming links per network node, okay? So it's pretty common place to have multiple hundred gigabits of network speed going out from each node, okay? So given these trends, broadly speaking, it's not always true, but broadly speaking, we could say that end host, or each adapter, the network bandwidth is mostly considered a solved problem, okay? We don't think that's much of an issue. The big issue, however, is network latency, okay? So network bandwidth is basically how much data can you dump on the network, okay? You can dump 100 gigabit per second of network. That's uh, sufficient, 200 gigabits, that's probably good enough. Network latency is how long will it take for me to send one byte of data from my network node to your network node, okay? That's a very hard problem, in fact, it's not limited by technology right now, it's limited by physics, okay? There's not much we can do about that. We're kind of hitting a wall of how far we can go with that, okay? So there was this uh, uh, panel going on recently, and uh, I think Mark, Mark Sneer was saying, bandwidth is easy, okay? You just add more network links, you get more bandwidth. Latency is hard, it's physics, okay? There's another uh, marketing person over there. He gets up and says, no, 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 that's not true. Latency is easy. You put a bunch of smart people on that and they'll fix it. 
bandwidth is hard. It costs real money. Okay. <laughs> but technologically speaking, I think latency is a harder problem to solve, but there is still room. We'll eventually hit a, a dead end, okay? We cannot keep pushing that, but there, there is some room we can push the latency forward. I'll talk a li little bit about that in the next few slides. Okay, so uh, let's go back to our simple network architecture, okay? We have the processors, memory, the IO bus, network adapters, switches, and so on, okay? This is what I said, this is 15 years ago, okay? This is not true today, but the idea was that everything was decoupled, everything had its own place, everything was connected through some IO to connect, okay? This is fine, but it has limitations because the density, how closely things are integrated was not that much, not that good, okay? So current systems for the past 15 years or so have been looking more like this, okay? So compared to this, the uh, memory controller, okay, that was decoupled from the processors nowadays are being integrated on the chip, on the processor itself, okay? So we, we don't have the extra connection to go to the north, uh, to, the, to the memory controller. Instead, the memory controller itself is sitting on the chip, and you still have the I.O. bus going to the network adapter and to the network switch, okay? This is what we have with current systems. Okay. This was not designed for networks this way. This was designed in order to make the memory bandwidth more scalable, new architectures, and so on. But as an artifact of that, one thing we need to realize is that now we have a close by network and far away network, okay? Because of this, as an artifact of this tighter integration of the memory controller onto the processor chip, for this processor, this network is closer, whereas for this processor, this network is further away, okay? And the more sockets you have, the more this distance increases. Um, with respect to the data transfer itself, this IO bus, there are several technologies that have, um, uh, impro the technology has improved a lot for this IO bus, okay? Uh, we have PCI Express, of course, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4, so that keeps increasing, that keeps pushing the bandwidth. HDX from AMD, which has been used for network adapters, that has been pushing the bandwidth as well. Uh, Intel has recently announced that they want to start using QPI for uh, connecting the network adapters, which is much higher bandwidth than PCI Express. And of course, NVIDIA's new technology for NVLink, which right now they use for GPUs, but they have announced that they want to start using that for network technologies as well, okay? So broadly speaking, this IO bus is not considered that much of a problem for the bandwidth of communication, okay? If you want to dump a lot of data on the network, usually this IO bus is not the problem. Usually this is faster than what the network adapter itself can push. So we tend to think that's, you know, that's a, a reasonably uh, scalable solution, having an IOBus, that's fine, as far as the bandwidth is concerned. However, if you talk about latency, the amount of time taken to go to the network, this IOBus has a lot of overhead because every time you want to send the network, you have to negotiate over this IOBus. You have to send control messages to negotiate over this IOBus to see how much data, uh, when can you send the data, when you have access to the IOBus, and so on. So the next generation, this is not the current chips, but the next generation of network adapters are looking to have even closer integration, okay? Of course, they have the memory controller still integrated in the processor, but they're also trying to have the network interface, okay? The network adapter integrated in the processor chip itself, okay? So it's essentially, it's moving to tighter integration, everything on the processor, right? That's, that's where the trend is moving to. So uh, this may improve network bandwidth, it's unclear whether it'll actually improve network bandwidth because the IO bus is not really that much of a bottleneck, okay? With NVLink and QPI and so on, the IO bus is you know, relatively fast, so I don't, it's unclear whether that'll improve the network bandwidth. However, it'll almost certainly improve the network latency, okay? Because the control messages required to negotiate between the processor and the network reduce, everything shrinks, and the latency improves, okay? So that's one of the big benefits that we are expected to get out of this integrated network on the processor chip, okay? And uh, one of the uh, things that people don't really pay a lot of attention to is improved network functionality, okay? Right now, since the network adapter is hanging off an IO bus, we don't tend to think about what we are losing. We only think about the data that's going out 
but we don't quite think about the, the functionality, okay? If the network adapter is hanging off IO bus, it's a, it's a second class citizen. Okay, it's not integrated into the processor, which means processor does its own thing, the IO network adapter does, it own, does its own thing, and they don't quite coordinate with each other. As in they don't, it's not very easy to coordinate with each other. One example is atomic operations. Okay, I'll talk a little bit, I have a picture of that later, but atomic operations are something both the network does and the processor does, okay? But each of those are only atomic within themselves. Okay, if you do a network atomic, it's atomic with respect to other network operations. If you do processor atomics, it's atomic with respect to other processor operations, but they don't work well together, okay? This sort of integration allows a closer coordination of the processors and the network where you can have for example, atomic operations be atomic for the network and the processor together, okay? That's some of the new functionality that this sort of integration provides, which people don't th tend to think about, which is very important when you're trying to design uh, very scalable systems which have processors and memory and lots of net uh, nodes connected with each other. Okay, that's with respect to the hardware components itself for the network adapter, but we should spend a minute to talk about the software protocols themselves. All right, so traditionally, we had TCP IP and UDP IP to drive the network, right? These are heavyweight stacks. They do copies because they don't expose, for example, memory registration to the user. Uh, they do, they rely on interrupts, prioritization, signaling, and so on. They're very heavyweight stacks. I will not go into the details of how these work, but these are, these have not been designed, for example, for intelligent networks. They've been designed for what are called as dumb networks, okay? So they tend to do a lot of the work themselves in software, causing a lot of performance overhead, okay? The trend for the past 15 years or 20 years or so has been towards offloaded protocol stacks, or sometimes called as protocol offload engines. What are protocol offload engines? Protocol offload engines are very simple. They essentially take the same or similar functionality as a TCP IP or UDP IP stack, but they try to implement those, they offload those on hardware. So the hardware itself tries to implement all of the functionality or similar functionality to TCP IP or UDP IP. Okay. That's a general trend going for most network adapters used in supercomputers. If you just compare with a, a traditional stack, you have your physical link net network transport application layers, traditional network stack, you have TCP IP, sockets interface, the routing layer, flow control, all that stuff. On offloaded stacks, you have something very similar. Physical layer, you have copper or optical. Uh, well, I guess technically you can have wireless too, but I don't think we'd ever use wireless on a supercomputer. Uh, and then you have the link layer, which more or less does the same thing as traditional link layers, which are ethernet. You have a network layer, which does the same thing, routing. Transport layers, traditionally is TCP or UDP, it just said reliable, unreliable protocols, okay? They don't have to be TCP and UDP. They could, but they don't have to be TCP and UDP. They could be any protocol that, fun uh, that serves similar functionality. And one thing over here, I said it's a low-level interface. Instead of sockets, we have a low-level interface, okay? It's a different interface, okay? Mostly, allowing you to expose the, uh, allowing the network to expose its functionality to the users, okay? It's a low-level interface. That's not what you as application scientists would look at, but that's what the network provides, okay? Someone else has to provide a higher level API, like MPI or PGAS or something on top of this low-level interface, okay? That's what you would program to. This low-level interface is what MPI developers have to understand about. And finally, you have application layer where MPI, PGAS, file systems, for example, would set. All right. Oh, uh, the key part over here is all of these layers are typically hardware offloaded. Okay, so the, these are implemented in hardware, so they are much faster than what you would do in a software stack. Okay, so the current situation with network API standards, earlier there used to be a lot of network specific, vendor specific APIs. InfiniBand Verbs, Menelux, MXM, IBM PAMI, Cray, Gemini, DMAP, whatever, okay, lots of them. So recently there has been an effort to try to consolidate this, to try to come up with some form of standard for uh, doing these uh, network, low level network functionality, okay? So Intel and Cisco and others, they came up with this new interface called as the Open Fabrics Interface. 
which tries to consolidate all these uh, APIs and exposes features, subset features. Any network is allowed to expose any subset of the functionality to the upper layers, okay? So they, they started this new effort and it's going full force. Uh, they started, I think, a year ago or so on, but it's going uh, well. Other vendors, unfortunately, were not happy with this <laughs> standardization initiative. So uh, Mellanox, IBM, Oak Ridge, and others uh, came up with a new uh, standardization <laughs> process called as the Unified Communication X. I don't know what that X stands for. I thought I was bad at names, but that one definitely is. But anyway, so they started this new process, and the idea was um, to have an efficient communication network layer that can expose functionality for both MPI and PGAS, OpenSchmem particularly, uh, sort of models. Unfortunately, there are others who are not, not happy with either of those. So in Japan, uh, Riken, Fujitsu, and NEC came up with a new standardization effort, and they started, they called it, they are bad at names too, they called it just low-level communication layer, LLC uh, layer, which tried, tries to provide a unified communication layer for, well, unified network layer for communication and IO and analytics and so on. So unfortunately, <laughs> there are too many standardization efforts. I, I think. This picture from XKCD explains <laughs> the current status of network APIs, network standards, way better than uh, I can. Okay, it's, we, I don't think we are any better than what we were before the standardization efforts started. We had 20 different APIs, now we have 23 different APIs, I think. But, but the good thing is that you don't have to worry about this as end users. This is all handled within the MPI stack or the PGAS stack or whatever uh, programming model you're using, uh, and you know, they are hidden from you in some sort. Um, so how does this work? So all this protocol has been offloaded on the network adapter, the hardware, right? Now I want to use that in some way. So the first thing I want to do is expose protection of some sort of protection to the user, because I can't arbitrarily let the user communicate from any memory, any physical memory, okay? We used to do that, DOS, MS-DOS, <laughs> he used to do that, and it was a security nightmare. Okay, so we moved, moved past that, we don't do that anymore. Um, so what the idea is that if I want to communicate from any buffer, I have to tell the network adapter that here is the buffer I want to communicate from, and the network adapter and the kernel operating system does some form of protection required for doing safe transfer while still making it efficient. So the way we do it is, the process tells the kernel saying, I want to send data from this buffer. Okay, or rather, I will eventually send data from this buffer, or receive data into this buffer, eventually, not right now, just I want to get it set up right now. So it gives a virtual address page to the kernel. The kernel takes the virtual address page, translates into physical pages, hints the physical pages, so that they don't, the virtual to physical address mapping does not change anymore. After that, it tells the network adapter, saying, here is the virtual address that the user wants to send from. Here are the appropriate physical pages that the data will come from or go into. And the network adapter can use this information, for example, to cache the, this, uh, this information so it can improve the network lookup, the, the page lookup. And finally, can the network tells the kernel, okay, I have cached the information, I'm ready. Then the kernel tells the user, okay, your virtual address memory buffer has been set up. So now you're ready. After this has been set up, now you can do communication to from this buffer, and the, the network adapter knows that this is protected because the kernel was involved in setting it up, and it is registered, which means that the virtual to physical address mapping will not change and everything will be smooth, okay? So this, there's a setup process involved. After that, communication is much faster. Hardware can directly look at the memory and send data or receive data from, from that memory. Okay, send receive communication. So the way it works is the processor tells the network adapter, here is the buffer I want to uh, receive the data into. Okay, so there is a queue that the network adapter keeps track of. Then the sender sends another message saying, here is the data, here's the buffer I want to send the data from. The network adapter takes this description, the send description, fetches the data where it needs to, the data needs to come from, sends it to the target network adapter. The target network adapter uses the matching receive information that is posted on the receive side and places the data into the appropriate location of memory. Okay, 
Very simple process, just like email exchange, right? You send some data, the receiver has to post and tell where the data is going to be received into. That's the send receive uh, sort of model. Once the data transfer completes, the network will tell the sender through some form of a completion queue saying the data transfer has completed. It will send a hardware ACK back to the sender and the sender now knows that the data transfer has completed. Okay, it's a very simple model. Everything is done in hardware. Okay, the, that's the important thing. Everything is done in hardware. So the network adapter is mostly handling everything. The only thing the processor is doing is on the receive side, it's posting a receive operation saying, I would like to receive the data into this buffer. On the send side, the, the processor is saying, I want to send the data from this buffer. Okay, and note that this description is independent of the message size. I can send one byte message or a gigabyte message with the same description, okay, just the length and the buffer address changes, okay? So that, that part is completely scalable with respect to the message size. There's no per byte cost that the processor has to get involved in. Of course, the network has to do more data transfer for larger messages, but the processor, amount of work by, done by the processor is exactly the same for one byte and for one gigabyte. That's one form of communication. There's also put-get communication where the data, the processor, the sender processor, uh, tells where the data is coming from as well as where the data is going into on the target process, and the network adapter looks at this information and takes the data and directly goes and puts it onto the target process memory. Okay, it's a very powerful paradigm that most modern network adapters provide, okay? It's a put, Paradigm. It's not a send-receive paradigm, it's a put paradigm. So you go and directly put data into someone else's memory, okay? This model is, uh, of course, the, the receiver in this case does not know that the data has arrived, but that's the point, okay? The point is I do not want to disturb the receiver uh, uh, when the data has arrived. In fact, the way you would use it is in a some sort of a notice board model, right? You have a notice board somewhere in someone's memory, you put data on a notice board, someone else gets data from the notice board, but who is hosting the memory does not, the processor, the process that is hosting the memory does not have to be disturbed, that is the CPU does not have to be disturbed while I'm putting data into that, or I can also do a get in a similar way, getting data uh, from the remote process memory. Okay, and the last part is atomic operations. It's very similar uh, to uh, put or get, or, or actually similar to a get operation, the processor sends the data uh, to be, for example, do a fetch and add. Okay, let's just say fetch and add. Okay, I want to do a fetch and add. And the processor sends the data to the target process. It specifies both the origin address and the target address. The target adapter fetches the original memory, uh, uh, the data, original data, does a fetch and add over here, puts the outcome of the fetch and add at the target buffer, and the original value back is sent back to the sender buffer. Okay, the atomic operations can also be done in hardware. This is true for most current hardware. Now, what atomic operations are supported changes from network to network. Okay, InfiniBand provides compare and swap and fetch and add. BlueGene provides a lot more atomic operations. And uh, the newer generation, the Cray networks are going to ha have a, a, a wide variety of network operations. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what the network operations are right now. But the, the, the what network atomic operations are supported varies with respect to network adapters, but the concept of atomic operations exists almost on all networks, okay? And one important thing to point out over here, the, the operation is made atomic by the network adapter, okay? But it has no relationship with the processor atomic operations. So if the processor has atomic operations on memory, the network does atomic operations on memory, they could clobber each other. Okay, very important point to remember. They are atomic only with respect to the network uh, operations. All right, that's uh, where we are currently uh, today. Uh, the trend, however, is towards more specialization of the network adapter. As I said, the network adapters already offload a bunch of the protocol stack. They do uh, transport layer, network layer, everything on hardware, okay? But the trend is to do, a, to do more specialization. Uh, for example, if you look at the BlueGene network, Crane network, and so on, they are already offloading a bunch of MPI and PGAS features on the network adapters, okay? Put get operation, for example, were more of a PGAS uh, nature sort of thing. Now MPI3 provides those capabilities as well. 
those capabilities are now provided in hardware. Atomic operations I talked about, uh, collective operations, MPI collectives, like broadcast and all gather. These, there are hardware primitives, so the network can offload a part of these on the network adapter itself in hardware. And new networks like the portals four, three or four based networks, they provide hardware matching for doing MPI send receive in hardware, okay? Completely offloaded in hardware. Okay, so the trend is that we, we no longer do stuff in software, most of this protocol stack, we already do it in hardware, but future adapters will have put more and more specialization on the hardware. They want to do almost all of MPI or almost all of PGAS in hardware uh, for applications to be able to use that. Okay, now you don't have to directly use this, but the thing for you to remember is that when you use MPI or PGAS, if you use MPI on a new, on a, uh, on a good network, the MPI implementer is supposed, if the MPI implementer does the, uh, developers do their job right, they will go and optimize the MPI implementation to take advantage of all these hardware capabilities provided on these network adapters. Uh, so the next part is the network topologies, okay? So this is with respect to the network, uh, so we talked about what the network adapters look like, right? What the, uh, how the network adapters work, how they send data, how do the atomic operations and so on. But once the data is sent out from the network adapter, it goes outside from the network adapter into the switches and so on, there is a whole topology over there, how these switches, how these network adapters are connected to each other. Okay, that's the network topology uh, that I want to spend a few minutes to talk about. So the best network <laughs> that you can build for performance is a crossbar, okay? It's essentially an all-to-all -all connection between all the, net, on the, all the nodes, okay? It's great, it's fantastic for performance, but it's just awful with respect to cost, <laughs> okay? Um, typically, this, are, this is done with a single network ASIC, single network chip, and today, uh, the biggest network chip, the single ASICs that you can find are about 64 ports, okay? So if you have a 64 node cluster, 64 network adapters, okay, any number of cores for the network adapter, but 64 network adapters, you can buy a single chip, a single, uh, a smallest level uh, switch, which is a single chip, that can go up to 64 ports, okay, it works great. Unfortunately, not scalable, you cannot keep building bigger ASICs because, well, it's too expensive. The good thing about this is all communication is non-blocking. If you pick any pair, any two pairs, uh, any uh, combination of pairs of processes and they communicate with each other, it's all non-blocking, okay? Great, great for performance. Well, we can't keep building bigger crossbars, so the next best thing we could do is build what is called as a factory topology, okay? A factory topology is essentially a collection of these uh, crossbars, each of these is a crossbar, you connect them in a tree fashion, with more links in the upper layers. And these are used very frequently on medium to, uh, small to medium scale clusters, okay, systems. These are very, very widely used. In fact, most systems out there, if you look at the network topologies, they're all factory topologies, okay. The good thing about these factory topologies are that they are pseudo non-blocking. Pseudo non-blocking, okay, not fully non-blocking. What that means is, given, if you, if you divide up all the process, processes in pairs, okay, all the nodes, if you divide, it, divide them up in pairs, there will exist paths such that all of these communications will be completely non-blocking, okay? There will exist paths where all these are non-blocking, but that does not mean that all paths are non-blocking, okay? Put another way, if you know, if you have a complete vision of the entire system, and if you know that all processes will talk to each other in pairs, then you can schedule them such that none of them will conflict, okay? So for example, if you're doing a global collective operation in MPI, MPI could schedule them such that there are no conflicts on the paths. However, if you're doing arbitrary point-to-point -point communication, okay, there is no guarantee that you will not have conflicts. In fact, in fact, it's very highly likely that you will have conflicts if you don't have this global uh, scheduling of who communicates with who. Okay, make sense? All right, so it's more scalable than crossbars because you know, you're building a tree, you're not building a full all-to-all -all connection, but it can still get very expensive at scale. I think clusters with about, I know clusters are about 20,000 nodes that use uh, uh, 
flat rate topologies. About less than 10,000 nodes is ideal, but I know uh, systems with up to 20,000 nodes that use flat rate. But after a point, that still gets very expensive because the cost of the links and the switches increases super linearly with the number of nodes. So you can't just keep building a flat rate system going to larger number of nodes. So uh, more recent networks are, um, they, the vendors keep calling them scalable networks, but they're only scalable with respect to the cost. They're not very scalable with respect to performance, okay? Uh, Taurus and Dragonfly, more recent one, uh, Dragonfly Plus is the more recent one, uh, are uh, topologies that people are considering. A Taurus network, it's a donut shape, right? Taurus thing. Uh, that, well, there's a picture if you can understand how that works, right? There's a, it's like a mesh, but you have this wrap connections uh, as well. This is a 3D torus, you have 5D torus or 6D torus, tori as well. Um, Blue Gene, Cray XC, and so on, and K Computer, they use a torus network. Cray XC uses a dragonfly network. These are more scalable with respect to cost, and the idea is that the, the network cost increases linearly with the system size, okay? So that's very effective with respect to the cost. But that means that there is more and more network sharing. Whenever you do this linear increase of the network with respect to the nodes, you have network sharing, okay? Um, and congestion is not just possible, it's probable, okay, <laughs> in, such, in such networks. Um, one takeaway, the important takeaway is that network sharing is, is already true, it will continue to be true in the future, so locality, the topology-based locality is more important than ever, okay? You can't just look at the network bandwidth. You can't say that I have a 100 gigabit per second network if it's going to be shared by 10 different processes, <laughs> okay? So you don't really have much network bandwidth if, it's, if you have more sharing, okay? So the closer you communicate with, the better it is for communication just because the amount of sharing that's going to happen in the network is just going to keep increasing. Uh, this is just a picture of the blue gene, IBM blue gene P, but I think the trend is true for any network. If you have two processes, P3 talking to P4 and P2 talking to P5, okay, so very simple communication, but this link over here between P3 and P4 is shared for both the communications. Your performance can drop by half uh, by, uh, if, you, if, if you are not, if you are, have one, one single overlapping link, okay. Imagine when you have a little bit more distant communication, what happens. This is true even if you are doing what you might be thinking as a nearest neighbor communication on the blue gene uh, system. In this case, if you're just based on the mapping, your actual physical layout of the processes might be very different from what your algorithmic view of the process layout is. Okay, so if you're not aware of the topology, you might be communicating all over the place. Okay, and your performance will drop significantly. Or more importantly, your network sharing will increase faster than you, you might think that it would. Okay. Last piece is the in, uh, interaction of the network and the processor and memory technologies, okay? The network is not independent. It will do its work, but it has to interact with how the processor and the memory subsystem behaves, okay? Um, one most important thing we need to remember is that network adapters are aware of your cache coherence protocols, okay? They have to deal with caching, processor caching, and they have to work with processor caching. So um, a simple example of how this works, again, this is a oversimplified picture. You don't no longer have the front side bus. This is integrated on the chip, but anyway, just, just for understanding, okay? So on the send side, I want to send data from, uh, from my memory or cache or whatever to the network, okay? If the data is in memory, okay, application buffer is over here. It's very simple. Take the data. Uh, actually, the network adapter sends a DMA request uh, to the memory controller, then the memory controller takes the data and sends it back to the network adapter. Very simple. Instead, if the application buffer is in cache, okay, it's not in memory, well, it's a copy is in cache, okay? If the data, I assume all of you have learned cache coherence protocols in your architecture class in grad school, or maybe there's a <laughs> lecture somewhere in this, uh, this week, uh, but there is there are the states, right? Modified, exclusive, shared, invalid, I'm not going to go into that. Hopefully you all know that because I'm going to assume that you know that. So uh, if it is in the, in the shared or exclusive state, there's no problem. It will just take the data and send it over the network adapter. If it is in a modified state, it will still send the data to the network adapter, but typically the, uh, the memory controller does the write back of the data going back to memory while it's being transferred over the network. Okay? This is a send side protocol. So the 
cache state is still maintained while you're sending data. On the receive side, it's a little bit more tricky. If the data is in cache, in, uh, if, it's, if it's in a exclusive or uh, uh, shared state, the cache is just invalidated, okay, and we are set. If it is in a modified state, the cache first has to be flushed back to memory, and then the network adapter is allowed to write to memory, okay? So I think you don't have to follow all these details of how exactly it's happening, but the important thing to take away is that you don't have to worry about what the state of your cache is, or what the state of your memory is. Network adapters are intelligent enough to know, to interact with your processor through the memory controller to see what the cache state is, and work around those in order to get the data uh, where it's supposed to go. Uh, two important trends that are happening. The first, I already talked hard a lot on atomic operations, I'll skip that. <laughs> the second is a direct cache injection. Okay, so I have been talking about how data has to go to memory. If it is in cache, it has to be invalidated or flushed back or whatever. There is a lot of trend going, uh, trends going towards uh, networks where you can do direct cache injection. Okay, on the receive side, if you get the data, instead of going to memory, the network can directly go and put the data in cache. Okay. Um, some systems in production already provide such capabilities, but it's a very tricky thing to have. You should be very careful when you use that capability because a direct cache injection is great if you want to use the data immediately, okay? But if you don't want to use the data immediately, you are corrupting your uh, cache. You are flushing something that you want to use. Okay, you fetch the data, put the data that you might eventually use in the future, but you pushed something away which you would need immediately. So it's a double-edged sword, so you have to be very careful when you're doing this cache injection because it's a limited amount of cache and you don't want to waste that if you don't have temporal locality. If you don't have, if you don't want to plan to use the data immediately, you shouldn't waste that uh, cache. And uh, atomic operations I already uh, mentioned. All right, so, uh, sorry, I think a little bit over. In summary, uh, every time we have a 10x improvement in performance, something breaks. <laughs> okay, that's the truth. <laughs> it always happens. Okay, um, here in the last 20 years, we have a million fold increase in performance. Okay, so I think we have come a long way, but we still have another two orders of magnitude performance to go before we get to exascale. Okay, and that means we will at least have two more breakages. <laughs> before you get to exascale, <laughs> all right? Something, you find a bug in your application which because you assume that it'll, the timing will be slow enough or whatever, always something will break, okay? So be prepared for at least two more breakages uh, going to exascale, okay? Uh, the network is just a small part of this ecosystem of the increase. The network itself is going to increase or tenfold, but there are processor technologies uh, improvement, the core specifically, that are also expected to increase about uh, the same magnitude. So there are interesting times <laughs> for computational science and architectures, um, de depending on what the definition of interesting is. Uh, but uh, I think there are good times to come and hopefully you'll learn uh, something during this two weeks uh, in the train. So I was uh, wondering about the power impact of, of integration. And at the same time, I was wondering about the, the effective cost, or at least the burden, of the integration of the network controller on chip, because this means that 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 processors will have to get specialized. This means that you cannot take off the shelf a processor and plug it into a supercomputer. Therefore, there will be the diversification. It will get more complex. The choice will be harder. And if you don't need that controller always, then, then, then you have to either compromise on not having integrated controller, or you will have it and then you need to somehow not use it or not, not, not uh, block it off from using power. Mm -hmm. So very good question. <laughs> so uh, you're right. One of the big uh, trends for this, making this denser, the densification of these things is power. If you have these decoupled things that are interconnected by some form of uh, IO bus or whatever, they use more power. If you integrate everything on a processor, first of all, the chip itself would take lesser power, plus the data movement itself would be lesser. So that's an actually very important piece uh, for the integration. With respect to whether the processor specialization is uh, applicable to the mass market, okay, 
the trend for network integration on processor actually does come from the mass market. It is not an HPC solution, okay? It came because people wanted the wireless network adapters on the laptops to be integrated in the process so that it can save energy. That way, that's where the trend started originally. And HPC people said, oh, if you're doing wireless uh, network integration, why don't you do faster network integration as well? So the processor vendors like Intel and so on, they, they obliged, they said, okay, that makes sense, we'll do it for other networks as well. Okay, so it is, uh, so a lot of the technology required for integration, that's being driven by the mass market. Not for high speed networks, but 90% of the technology is the same even for wireless uh, adapters. But that's a good question and it will be applicable for mass markets. We don't want to do something that's not applicable for mass market. We, we can't afford it. Are there other questions? Um, also a question on the integration of network interface on the chip. Mm -hmm. Does that also mean you know, multi socket will be dying? Uh, no, no, not, not at all. Uh, so you will still have close by network and fast away network, fast, far away network, okay? So that is, okay, um, so even before we do the network integration on chip, okay, even when you have traditional NUMA systems, we already have this close by network and far away network, okay? So if this is for the multi-socket multi systems. By reducing, by essentially squashing this IO bus, you, you didn't change any of that feature. You still have another processor, P1, sitting over here, the P0, if it has to get to this network adapter, it has to go over QPI or whatever to P0 and then communicate over the network. So it can still use the network adapter through this chip, okay? Just in this, exactly the same way as P1 can I still access this memory, right? P0 can still access this memory, right? In this new architecture, it just has to go through this memory controller to get to that memory. But it has more hierarchy. That's right. So, so the 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 to close the notion of close by network, far away network does not change, but just adds more hierarchy as you go for better integration and things of that sort. Okay, but the notion doesn't change. Right. Um, but why doesn't P1 has its own network interfaces? You could you could have its own network in, uh, interfaces. Now the question is, do you want to have as many network adapters as number of sockets? That's, you know, that's a system design issue and cost issue and things of that sort. But there's technologically, there's no requirement to not have a network per socket.